Coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, health and safety in the evolving dry cleaning industry. Public health research cannot catch up with the fast development of new chemicals and new technologies. In the future, it's really going to be about the industry working more openly. Why the dry cleaning industry faces hurdles as it tries to switch to less toxic cleaning solvents. Plus what the U.S. can learn from Europe when it comes to chemical safety. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, June 22nd, 2017. I'm Amy Monomiro. And I'm Noah Levitt. Amy, this week we'll be looking at how America's rapidly changing dry cleaning industry is grappling with health and safety concerns tied to the chemicals used in the process. Noah, dry cleaning uses organic solvents to clean clothes or other fabrics. These solvents evaporate quickly and are more effective at cleaning stains compared to soap and water. But the chemicals used have changed over time, and there's a new push to develop solvents that are less harmful to human health and the environment. When you drop off your clothes at the local shop, you may see signs touting organic or natural cleaning products. But are these products safer? The answer to that question is a complicated one. We'll be getting some help from Diana Ceballos, a research scientist in the Center for Health and the Global Environment here at the Harvard Chan School. She spent time not only studying dry cleaning chemicals, but also speaking with workers in some of the United States' 36,000 commercial dry cleaning businesses to understand the challenges they face. We'll talk to her about the push to develop less toxic cleaning solvents, and also why Europe is far ahead of the U.S. when it comes to regulating chemicals. In order to understand changes in the dry cleaning industry, you need to understand the history. And it's an industry that's come a long way. Dry cleaning actually dates back to the 1600s when turpentine was the main solvent used. Clothes were basically soaked in large vats and hung up to dry. The first commercial dry cleaning businesses opened in the 1800s, says Ceballos. And uh, used gasoline, kerosene, and uh, continued with the same open bath system for a long time until the 1900s, where the first generation of dry cleaning machine was invented that basically was a closed system that helped recycle the solvent. Despite those improvements, uh, the dry cleaning industry was notorious for fires, and it was extremely dangerous to own a dry cleaning or live by a dry cleaner because fires were extremely common. And so because of that, um, there was uh, the development of new dry cleaning solvents that would not be as fire prone uh, like perchloroethylene. Perchloroethylene, or perk, became the most widely used chemical. Because it's chlorine-based, it is inflammable. But perk came with a range of safety concerns for human health and the environment. It's a potential carcinogen, which can be irritating to humans, contributes to air pollution when it's released from dry cleaning machines, and if it's dumped, it can remain in the watersheds for a long time. Because of these concerns, the EPA has started pushing to eliminate the use of perk in dry cleaning shops located in residential buildings by 2020. And states have also started taking action, most notably California, which wants to end all use of PERC by 2023. And there has been a renewed interest in creating alternatives to PERC. These include a solvent called 1-bromopropane, another called butylil, and an array of hydrocarbon solvents. There have also been improvements in machine technology to reduce worker exposure to fumes when opening doors or refilling solvents. But there are still risks with these chemicals, and many unknowns, because scientists often don't have a chance to fully review a solvent before it enters the market. And this leaves dry cleaning workers particularly vulnerable. The shops where they work are often small businesses, heavily reliant on immigration labor, and there's often language barriers, says Ceballos. All of this increases the risk for chemicals to be mishandled. For example, one of the new solvents that are now gaining popularity both here and in Europe is uh, butylol, and that one can potentially form formaldehyde in certain conditions. And and the manufacturer says that, you know, under normal expected operating conditions, it should hold well. And thankfully, with our preliminary assessments, it sounded as if formaldehyde was not being formed. But the reality is that if, if, if the owner has a machine that is not working properly or is not adding sort of the pH stabilizers and other things that the process requires, who knows, it's possible that this formaldehyde that is a very 
irritant carcinogenic and hazardous chemical could be produced and so you know there's a lot of risks that go with the education but there's a lot of limitations that put them in a vulnerable position what Ceballos is describing with butylil is a prime example of what the public health researchers call regrettable substitution Oftentimes, amid the push to develop alternatives, new chemicals will be rushed into the market without fully understanding their long-term health effects. Public health research cannot catch up with the fast development of new chemicals and new technologies. And at the end, you know, the fu- in the future, it's really going to be about the industry working more openly in terms of what is the evidence that there's definitely support for going forward with a particular alternative and not just to fill a market gap, so to speak. Compounding the problem is the limited regulation surrounding chemicals in the U.S. Many people incorrectly assume that products like dry cleaning solvents are thoroughly tested by the EPA or other federal agencies before they can be used. Except for pesticides and pharmaceuticals, that's not the case. Ceballos says it's incredibly hard to ban chemicals in the U.S. or even block them from entering the market. Even asbestos, with its myriad of documented health effects, hasn't been banned. It's important to note that when it comes to dry cleaning, there is often local oversight because businesses must receive permits before they can open. And there is a push to change things at the federal level in the form of revisions to the 1976 Toxic Substance Control Act, or TSCA. The new law will require the EPA to prioritize chemicals for safety testing, reviewing a minimum of 20 chemicals at any one time to see if they pose a, quote, unreasonable risk to humans and the environment. Among the chemicals on that list is a dry cleaning solvent we mentioned earlier, one bromopropane. Ceballos says task reform is a step in the right direction, but ultimately it doesn't go far enough. According to Joe Al, an assistant professor of exposure assessment science at the Harvard Chan School, There are 80,000 chemicals already in use across the U.S. and nearly 2,000 new chemicals introduced each year. In other words, there's almost no way for the EPA to review all of the chemicals on the market. So what's the solution? Sabio says the U.S. can learn lessons from Europe and its rigorous REACH regulations. REACH stands for Registration, Evaluation, Authorization, and Restriction of Chemicals. It requires all companies manufacturing or importing chemical substances into the European Union in quantities of one ton or more per year to register these substances and to provide detailed information on their health and environmental effects, such as toxicology studies and risk assessment. So far, nearly 150,000 chemicals have been registered. Because it covers the entire EU, Ceballos says REACH can be more effective in pushing the industry to raise standards for chemical safety. And so it's just much more aggressive and effective and because I think that having the conglomerate of countries actually forces markets to shift because it's like it's a very lost market if they don't if they're not able to commercialize uh, within the European Union so it actually makes a big difference it's like when Walmart comes out and says we don't want these chemicals in our products because they 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 are huge uh, a huge market for many small businesses and, and people, in, they force markets to change. I mean, those things make a difference. Um, and so I think that even if we were able to mimic Europe, we would be much better shaped than we are right now. Ceballos says consumers can also play a role in pushing the industry to change by supporting dry cleaning businesses that have invested in new technology and safer chemicals. Most of the businesses that are switching to some of these new solvents are often, if not in most cases, renewing and changing their machines. So that alone is a huge improvement for reducing emissions, for reducing exposure to the workers, uh, optimizing the process, uh, saving energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually think that supporting those businesses is, is, is the right way to go. But Ceballos also says consumers should be cautious of something called greenwashing. As we mentioned at the top of the show, dry cleaners will often tout their products as natural or organic to present an environmentally responsible image to the public. Here's the bios again. For example, for a dry cleaning to say it's organic only because it uses an organic solvent is a play on words. But if a consumer is ignorant, uh, when you hear organic, you really think healthy. You know, you think of organic food, you think it's less chemicals. And in truth, just because you're using an organic solvent and saying that it's organic is not technically 
incorrect, but is not also technically correct. So it's sort of like this vagueness and use of words that can truly deceive a cost customer. It's almost like a charge for consumers to be educated in what they're choosing. So for example, the butylol, um, you know, it's, it's actually a very pugnant sort of fruity smell. Um, it can give you like if when I was one of one of these shops, I couldn't be more than an hour in one of these shops. It would give me a headache. It was an extremely, extremely harsh smell. So if you're a very sensitive person to smells, for example, I will discourage you from using that uh, dry cleaner unless you air the clothes maybe before you 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 put them in your home. You know, little things like that. So you just have to do your research and see what what you are actually ask your dry cleaners what solvent they're using uh, and, and do your homework to learn. And if you want to learn more about the dry cleaning industry and the chemicals used, we'll have some resources on our website, hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. And a reminder that you can always listen to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. <laughs>